Good morning, everyone. Today in class, we are talking about social exchange theory. Um, there is an additional YouTube clip that you need to watch that will help better explain this uh, from a uh, communication, relationship, social scientific approach uh, that has to do, um, the video you're going to watch has to do with economics. Uh, we'll get there in a second, but it'll help set up a easier way to understand how social exchange theory sort of posits um, various assumptions. So to start off with, social exchange theory, right, um, is a major force in interpersonal relationships. So this has to do with one-on-one -on -one communication strategies, all right, um, and it has to do with this idea that, you know, People are going to act in ways in these relationships that they have that try to serve their self-interest. And if you're doing it correctly, your self-interest will be served as well as the person uh, that you're communicating with as far as some sort of relationship. When a relationship happens, both people in the relationship need to be satisfied, right? So um, the social exchange part isn't monetary, right, as it would be in economics, but in a relationship sense, it's the giving of time, the supporting each other's goals, right? The sense of community and belonging. So both people have to feel satisfied. That's what social exchange theory is getting at, all right? Self-interest is not necessarily, um, not considered necessarily bad and can be used to enhance the relationship. Interpersonal exchanges are thought to be analogous to economic exchanges uh, where people are satisfied when they receive a fair uh, return for their expenditure. So if I'm gonna give the effort to hang out with you, to um, be in a friendly relationship with you, to be in a romantic relationship uh, with a person, right? Both people have to feel like their efforts are worth um, what they're getting out of the relationship. And if they're not getting those things out of the relationship, they're gonna say, okay, my time, my effort, my energy, uh, the things that I am expending in order to be in this relationship might not be worth it. So I might need to move on to a different relationship or sever ties with this relationship. One thing I do wanna stress here, the idea of self-interest is not necessarily bad uh, as far as this, um, you know, with regard to, you know, how this definition sets it up. And I want to, I would just want to really, we really want to stress that usually when we hear the term like being selfish or being self-interested, it has this very negative connotation, but I'm going to ask you to be very dispassionate about it, which we've talked about, right? Um, but in a very neutral sense, we're all self-interested, right? We go to, like, you go to college because you are self-interested in, having better job prospects for yourself, all right? Um, you act in very sort of self-interested ways. Um, so the way in which you treat your friends is because you'd like them to sort of reciprocate, you know, um, the sort of like the caringness and compassion and, and, and kindness, uh, you know, that you receive from them. You're trying to give that to them. So like there is a self-interested, uh, all of us are self-interested in, in various ways. We all like selfishly in some ways. And again, this has a negative connotation. But the way in which we all move through the world is to better our own livelihood, all right? So that's what this idea of self-interest is about, is um, if, I, if I want to get something from you, uh, there's something good about being self-interest uh, motivated because if I act poorly towards you, um, I'm not going to get what I need from you. I'm not going to receive what I need from you in terms of, you know, friendship, for instance, all right? So... I treat you well as a friend because I am self-interested in having people around me and having relationships and having community. All right. So get this idea of like self-interest, uh, selfishness, get that away from uh, the sort of pure connotative uh, definition of bad, always bad, and that we should all be altruistic and just constantly giving of ourselves. That's not true, right? You should be acting in a self-interest way. Um, and most of the time, right? Uh, in a in a sort of a free society, you know, me acting in a self interest way means that I need to treat other people well. Because if I treat other people well, the self interest part is well. If I want them to treat me well, I need to treat them well. All right. Um, so if I treat them poorly, they're going to treat me poorly, right? So it's not in my self interest to treat people like garbage. Okay. So in order to understand social exchange theory, the economic component, it's going to be helpful to understand. Um, I, I put true capitalism and free trade here. Capitalism, um, it gets a little bit of a bad rap in, uh, rep in, uh, in, in circ uh, certain circumstances. Uh, so I want you to just watch this YouTube video. It's like a five-minute video. I'll post it below uh, by this economist named Walter Williams, who I actually have a uh, little um, different YouTube video uh, to sort of a pay an homage to him. He passed away uh, a few months ago. Um, he was an economist at George Mason for many, many years, and he made this quick little five-minute five, five minute video 
to explain how capitalism sort of works in its purest form, right? Not all the crony stuff, the government bailouts, the manipulation of stocks, right, on Wall Street, but just sort of like what capitalism is sort of at its core as far as an economic function for societies, you know, roughly four or 500 years ago when capitalism started to kind of get the engine behind it uh, for structuring various sort of uh, nation state economic systems. So capitalism and free trade, I'll let Dr. Williams explain it better than I can, but a couple of things here that you should know about it. Number one, it requires no force, all right? So there's no third party involved, right? Uh, two people, right? I have, um, I own a coffee shop, I have coffee, you have $3. We voluntarily exchange those things. There's no third person up here, like, you know, as Williams would discuss, like a government entity saying, like, I have to keep my, you know, coffee at $3 or, you know, coffee has to be, you have to charge $5. You only have to charge $1. Um, nobody forces the customers to buy coffee. Customers can buy coffee or not buy coffee, right? So on the capitalism in its purest form is just two people. Each of them have a thing and they choose to voluntarily exchange those things. All right. The other thing about capitalism is um, is that it's a it's it's set up to be a win win situation. So I value uh, if I if I have the coffee, I value your three dollars more than I value my coffee, and you value the coffee more than you do your three dollars, right? And so both of us walk away with a quote unquote good deal. All right. I'm not going to give you the coffee if I don't think that three dollars that your three dollars is enough, right? And you're not going to take my coffee if you don't think my coffee is worth three dollars. All right. So it has to be voluntary. And at the end of it, if we both voluntarily give up one of our possessions in order to get another possession, somewhere along the line, we are thinking that that possession is worth more than the thing that we currently have. Otherwise, we wouldn't trade it. We would save our thing in order to trade it for something that we thought was of more of, of more value. Now, I have had some students say, well, what about if I think it's a, of, of equal value? Right. So I go to a store and I buy a ten dollar shirt. Even if you think it's of equal value, there's there's a lot of hidden cost in those products. So you're not just buying the shirt, but you're buying all the time and labor that went into making that shirt. So even though my shirt necessarily, let's say my shirt is a, a ten dollar t shirt, right? Um, I might say like, ah, it's just you know, it's just a little bit of fabric in a certain shape to you know cover my you know cover my torso. Um, but there's a lot of sort of like time. Like it's, I'm not just getting the shirt for ten dollars, but I'm also saving time because I don't have to make my own shirt. All right, so giving someone else ten dollars to make the shirt for me is is worth it. So I'm going to give you ten dollars, right? People do this with like home improvement projects, right? Uh, I don't want to cut my yard, so I pay someone else to cut my yard, and you're like, eh, it costs like forty dollars to cut my grass, but my time that it would have taken me to cut my grass, my time is more valuable than the forty dollars I'm giving up in order to have someone else cut my grass for me. All right, so no force, it's all voluntary, and it's win-win because both people feel like they walk away. With a good deal. And if you don't think it's a good deal, then you shouldn't give up the thing. All right. Okay. So again, back to this idea of self-interest is awesome, right? Get away from those negative connotations. All right. So uh, Williams asked some of these questions like, why do farmers grow food? Um, why does Apple make iPhones? All right. They make phones because they're self-interested. All right. They would like to make a profit off those phones. Um, and there's plenty of people at the top of the company who maybe they, ha you know, they have enough money, right, to survive the rest of their life. But they're trying to, like, leave their mark on the world. Right. Um, so they keep engaging in these creative projects because they want to leave their mark on the world. When you get this question um, about why farmers grow food, uh, it, Williams has a good example in this video where he talks about how, you know, um, you know, some farmer, you know, some cattle rancher up in, let's say, North Dakota doesn't wake up at four in the morning in the freezing cold uh, to take care of all of his cattle because he, you know, is altruistic. Like he really cares about people in New York City having a really good steak. Like that's not why he does it. <laughs> Right. He, he's self-interested, like he wants to make a profit from it. Now, the fact that people in New York are going to have a delicious steak um, is, you know, a benefit uh, for those people in New York. But the farmer's not doing it because he wants to feed all of these wealthy people steak uh, in Manhattan. He's doing it because he has a self-interest in making a profit. And again, if he takes his self-interest seriously, he's like, I really want to make a lot of money. The people in New York, like they benefit, too. Right. Because they get a juicy, delicious steak. Um, you know, when they go to a, you know, you know, a big five-star restaurant or whatever. Okay. So watch that video. It'll do a better job uh, explaining some of the ins and outs of uh, economics and how that, then you can sort of start to see how that translates into social exchange theory from a social scientific relationship perspective. So some of the assumptions of social exchange theory, 
Humans seek rewards and they try to avoid punishment. So again, acting self-interest with, with self-interest doesn't mean that, I, that I'm acting negatively towards other people, that I'm abusing other people. I'm going to treat people well because I want them to treat me well, right? If I treat people well, I'm going to be rewarded for it. If I treat people poorly, I'm going to be punished. And punished could mean like I'm going to lose my friends, right? People aren't going to want to hang out with me on the weekends. Um, in a social media uh, environment world, I might lose Facebook friends, right? Like I, I don't want to do that. So there's ways in which I have to treat people well if I do want to accumulate, um, if I, yeah, if I want to accumulate certain items uh, in life. All right. Um, humans are rational. And what we mean by this is that they act in rational ways in order to get what they want. Um, that doesn't mean that they're always thinking logically. Uh, but what it means is that they're going to act in ways in order to get what they what they what they want. All right. Um, so, you know, I know that if I treat people poorly my entire life, I'm going to grow, you know, become old. I'm going to live by myself and I'm going to be that you know old guy who's yelling at kids to stay off his lawn. I don't want to end up like that. Most people don't. Um, so I need to act in a way that is rational to fulfill, you know, whatever long-term goals I have for myself when it comes to, again, seeking community and friendships and relationships. Um, the standard that humans use to evaluate cost and rewards varies over time, right? So a punishment today might, I might not see that as a punishment tomorrow, a reward today, I might not see that as a reward tomorrow. So for instance, my needs are different today, um, than uh, when I was 20 years old, all right? So right now I'm 36, almost 37, all right? Um, they're 17 years later, you know, I have different needs than when I was 20. So when I was 20, there was something about like being on a big, I was on I was a big, you know, 20,000 student college campus. Um, there was ways in which sort of like being connected to various student organizations and going to parties. Like there's ways in which I want to sort of fill my time with people that's different than the ways I want to fill my time with people today, all right? My social group is a lot smaller. I, I have very, I have fewer interests as far as like these extracurricular activities. In college, it's like, let's be a part of every club out there. Let's get to know 500 people. Um, today, it's like, keep, a, keep, keep close relationships with about two dozen people. Um, you know, expend your energy into the areas of about three or four different things, right? Uh, and, you know, you'll be rewarded in that regard. Um, and so you're, reward what you see as a reward is going to is going to vary over over the course of um, your life um so is a relationship work, worth it we'll set up a basic economic uh model for this i know this is a bit crude to look at re relationships with economic models but it makes sense and then we can translate that into less sort of like monetary ways okay um so anytime we're looking at is something worth it we always say okay what's the reward how much am i going to get out of this relationship and then what's the cost so on a scale of one to 10, let's say that I'm in a relationship and the reward is a seven. It's a really good friendship, right? I get a lot like my friend, you know, they're texting me, they're calling me, they're hanging out with me a lot. I feel like they support me and my goals and my dreams and all this other kind of stuff, right? But the cost is a four, right? Because, you know, doing relationships does take time and energy and effort. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, I'm still like plus three. I'm still in the positive here. So the, the cost is, you know, anytime you get involved in any sort of relationship, there is a cost. Your time, your energy, your effort, right? Possibly your money. Like if you and your friends want to go out, like there's a cost to that. Um, but you always say, okay, what's the reward? All right. You might be in a relationship where the rewards, rewards only a two, right? You're expending a lot. Like this person wants to call you all the time, hang, you know, so it's a lot of energy and effort on your part. But they're just, they're just not a supportive friend, right? Every once in a while, they have their moments, like they're fun, right? You know, you have that real crazy friend at a party. It's like, haha, it's fun to laugh at him sometimes. But man, there's so much cost on the back end. It's like, is that one hilarious moment once a month when my friend goes out and parties a little too hard, is that really worth all the time and energy? Maybe this relationship is constantly a negative five. And so maybe I need to sever ties with it. All right. So there you have it. Um, when we think about like rewards over time real quick, um, if you just think about like romantic relationships, like what you need in a romantic relationship is different when you're 20 than when you're 37. All right. Um, so again, rewards, they're going to constantly change and vary. And so a relationship for you today, when you're 20, you might say like, this relationship is great. It fulfills all of the needs I want. If the person you're dating when you're 20 is the same person when you're 37, you might look at that person and be like, all right, it's time for you to grow up. They're like, I haven't changed. And it's like, yeah, that's the problem. You haven't changed. 
this was real fun and cute when you when we were 20 and it was really fulfilling my reward you know uh it was really fulfilling the rewards that i was seeking you know fun spontaneity you know going out and partying like that was real but now we're 37 right and um you know there's other things that i need in a relationship like stability and not spending all of our money on booze every weekend right i need something different so your the what you are seeking as far as rewards is going to change over the course of your life um and so this is why sometimes relationships um dissolve it's not because anybody's a bad person it's just that you know people are seeking out different rewards right some people mature a little bit um, they're seeking new rewards. Some people just stay like, no, 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 I'm just going to be, you know, a college party animal for my whole life, you know, woohoo, right? Carpe diem or YOLO or whatever kids are saying these days, right? Um, so rewards are going to change, right? And so it's not that anybody's a bad person. It's just that people are seeking different re rewards. And so if you and your friend aren't on that same wavelength, um, you might be for a couple years and then you might kind of diverge as far as like what you're looking for a relationship. Same thing is true with dating. Okay. Prisoner's dilemma. You just need to kind of know what this concept is. It comes out of this, um, mathematical theory known as game theory. And what game theory is, is, um, it tries to envision certain scenarios the various scenarios that could play out in order to figure out the probability of what is likely to happen right so yeah when you when you're involved in um game theory what you're trying to do is figure out how like the various ways a situation could unfold all right before the situation unfolds and then you look at it and you say okay how likely is it that these various situations are going to unfold so you might hear, you know, really you know, like super dorks like myself use terms like let's game this out, right? Let's sort of like, here's a scenario in front of us. Okay, let's figure out the different paths that this situation could go down. How could people react in various situations? And then we get to the conclusion and we say, okay, how likely are each of these like these conclusions you know, as far as probability with them, with them happening? So the prisoner's dilemma is the most common one. Um, I believe it was the 1950s when this first kind of came into, um, when, the, when the prisoner's dilemma first became like the major way of explaining or helping to explain game theory. Um, you can look that up. All right. So what happens in the prisoner's dilemma is two criminals are caught and they're interviewed separately. All right. And this is the game that each of them are trying to figure out is like whether or not my friend's going to snitch on me. All right. So if Jones and Smith, these are the two criminals, if they both confess, ooh, they both get life in prison. That's not good. All right. If Jones confesses, so he snitches, right, and Smith denies, it, <coughs> excuse me, Smith denies it, Jones gets to go free because he was, you know, he was a good guy. Um, Smith was lying to the cops. They don't like that. Smith is going to get life, right? So Jones is sitting here like, ooh, if I confess, do I think Smith is going to deny it? Because if I confess and Smith denies it, I get to go free. But, ooh, if we're both good guys and we both confess, we're both going to get life in prison. So we're trying to game this out. Jones is trying to figure out, what do I do? Jones could say, I deny it. But he's like, ooh, my buddy might snitch on me, right? So I'm going to get life and then Smith is going to go free, right? Or what could happen is if they both deny it, maybe there's not enough evidence behind it. They're going to get shorter sentences as some sort of accomplices. Maybe they're going to get five years instead of life, right? Um, the cops have a little bit of evidence, but they don't have enough evidence to put them away for life. They only have enough evidence to put them away for five years. So that's the prisoner's dilemma, right? Jones and Smith both go into the interview box, all right? And they both have to figure out how is my accomplice, right? How is my fellow criminal, how are they going to respond to the cops? Because that is going to determine how I respond to the cops, right? Do I think my buddy's going to confess? Because if my buddy confesses, right, and I confess, I'm going to get life. If my buddy confesses and I deny it, I'm going to get life and he's going to go free, all right? So there's various situations that you kind of have to play out in your mind as you go into this prisoner's dilemma type of situation, right? Here's the thing, right? The answers to 
the the answer to how you you know the prisoner should answer it's going to be dependent on the interdependent relationship to one another right so as you're playing out these sort of game theory situations in your own life one of the things that you're also doing is trying to predict how your friend or your loved one or your romantic partner how are they going to respond because how i act in a certain situation is greatly dependent on how how i am predicting my friend or my romantic partner or my significant other, how, how it is that they're gonna respond. So this is how we sort of manage our relationships. If I know that I have a relationship where I can really be, let's say aggressive and assertive with my friend, if my friend messes up, right? If my friend does something, um, you know, inappropriate, you know, does something like, not illegal, but, you know, does something that, you know, I consider like, you know, immoral, right? Or, or terrible, right? Um, can I go at them really aggressively? Right. Can I go at them aggressive? And I'm like, okay, if I go at my friend aggressively, maybe they're going to break down and cry and they're going to sever the relationship. If I go at my friend aggressively, maybe it's a tough love kind of guy. Right. So if I go after him really aggressively, maybe he's like, yeah, you're right. So I have to figure out like, who is my friend and how can I approach my friend to sort of discuss a situation? All right. Do I need to go at the person aggressively? Do I need to go at them more kindly and compassionately? Maybe if I go too kind and compassionate, Maybe my friend will respond well and say, thank you for being a good friend and being compassionate. Give me a second chance. Maybe if I can, I, I, I go after my friend compassionately, maybe they think, you know what, Josh is a real softy and I can get away with this all the time. All right. So we're always trying to find that balance in our romantic relationships um, or um, in our significant relationships, right? Our interpersonal relationships, all of them, romantic friendship, whatever, because we have to know how the other person is going to respond. If I, there's, there's plenty of people I have in my life I can be extremely aggressive with and say, you messed up, I'm your friend, I'm telling you out of this, this out of tough love, I can push you really hard, and they respond to that in, in a positive way. There's some people I know if I go too aggressive at them, they're going to fall apart and break down, and they're going to be like, I need a month off from this relationship, all right? There's some people I can be very kind and compassionate with, and they, you know, say, oh, thank you very much for being kind and compassionate, I'll change my ways. Some people, you're kind and compassionate, and they're just like, all right, I know I can get away with it. I'm going to steamroll over you now, right? I know I can get away with this nonsense, right? So this is something that we're always doing in our, in our relationships. Um, I do this with the kids that I coach, all right? There's like 35 kids on the wrestling team. Some of the kids, I can get in their face. I can yell at them. I can tell them they totally screwed up, and they, they respond to it in a positive way. Some kids, they just fall apart. Same thing with students that I teach, right? Some of you all... I can be very direct with and say like, look, this paper is garbage. And you're, you're like, yeah, it's garbage, right? And you do a better job. Some students I've had, I tell them their paper is garbage and they drop out of the class. They don't want to hear it. They kind of fall apart, right? So this is the game. These are the, some of the games we're always trying to figure out as far as what's our relationship, how's it unfold, and how do I need to sort of interact with the people around me? All right, evaluating a relationship. We have this comparative um, level. So what should I be getting out of this relationship? Am I getting more rewards or is it incurring more costs? So we always compare our relationship with regard to what the ideal situation for our relationship is versus what we're actually getting. And then we compare it, right? So in a dating relationship, we have certain expectations going in. Um, you don't get everything that you want in a dating situation, in a romantic relationship, but you start to compare it and say, okay, it's not as great as I thought, but am I getting more rewards out of it than the costs are concerned? So that's kind of how um, we're constantly evaluating our relationships. Comparison level for alternatives, right? So you go into a relationship, let's say a romantic relationship again, a dating situation, and now you're trying to figure out, um, is, is there something better out there, right? So I'm not getting what I want, which is the comparison level, right? So because I'm not getting what I want compared to my ideal, now you're saying, am I getting what I want compared to an actual other person I could be dating? All right, so that's how we evaluate things. We evaluate things in terms of what's my ideal and am I getting it? And then we evaluate things in terms of like, this is what I have. Is there something better out there, tangibly better out there for me? All right. Exchange patterns, you need to know these for the test, right? Not all relationships are created equal with regard to um, how you exchange uh, um, sort of like kindness, compassion, sense of community, right? They're not all the same, all right? So behavioral sequence, all right? My action depends on your action, so it's reciprocal, 
right? You treat me with respect, I treat you with respect, all right? But we probably have the same power in the situation if it's just a friendship. Now, exchange patterns based on power. So now you can get in like a teacher-student relationship or a boss and employee situation. So the way in which you treat your boss, you might have to treat your boss better than your boss treats you because at the end of the day, your boss is signing the paychecks, all right? Not completely fair, but you have to recognize like my boss can afford to treat me not that well because part of his exchange to me, it's not just treating me well, but he's actually giving me a paycheck for it. So the only thing I got going for me is treating my boss really, really well. My boss has treat me okay, but he also gets to substitute that with a paycheck. So that's now we have this sort of even exchange. All right. Um, so if there's power in a situation, the person with power can afford, right, to treat you a little bit not as well because, you know, they're giving you additional things um, that you can't give them, right? They're giving you a paycheck, they're giving you status, they're giving you, you know, other things besides just like sort of like, you know, kind, compassionate relationship. Fate control, the ability to affect the other person's outcome, right? Um, even if I don't like you, right? Uh, this may be horrifying, oh, excuse me, if I don't like you, this may be horrifying because I don't care what your attitude towards me is. If I like you, it might require you to work less um, because I also value your friendship. So if I have, if I'm a boss, if I have control over whether or not you get a promotion, right? Um, so if I like you, right, you might be able to get away with working not as hard, right? So if you have a really good relationship with your boss, you might be able to get away with something. Right, that the other employees can't get away with. Uh, and finally, behavioral control, the ability to change a person's behavior, which is back to reward and punishment. Um, so if you have the, if, yeah, if you have the ability to, if, if you know that if you treat your friend kindly and compassionately, your friend is uh, gonna treat you kind and compassionately back, Right. If there's there, there's always ways in which we move through the world to try to get people to treat us in the way we want to be treated. All right. So saying please and thank you uh, might mean that you, you know, you get a free drink at the bar right from the bartender um, saying please and thank you uh, treating your waitress really, really well at a restaurant uh, might means that they, you know, they you know give you a few extra fries or give you a free dessert. Right. So there's ways in which we're constantly moving through our life, trying to treat people in ways in which um It'll be reciprocated and we will be treated well um, on the back end of the exchange. All right, finally, know these for the test, right? And I'll go through these quickly. A direct exchange, right? So these are exchange structures. A direct exchange is just between two people. So we go back to that first slide, right? I give you money, you give me coffee, the exchange is over, right? So it only involves two people. A generalized exchange is sort of like a pay it forward situation. So exchange is reciprocated via social network. So if I help you move, right, and let's say you're moving from Pennsylvania to Colorado, right, you live in Colorado now, so I can't necessarily help you out anymore. You can't help me out anymore, right? I helped you move. You can't really give it back, right, next time I move. But because I helped you move, you are might be compelled to help others. So if I help you move to Colorado, now you're in Colorado, and maybe your neighbor in Colorado is getting ready to move. Maybe you help them because you realize that, you know, your neighbor helped you, right? So there's this sort of like, uh, yeah, there's this sort of like generalized like karma kind of thing going on here where you treat people in your community well, not because you think that they're going to treat you well back directly, but because you want other people in your neighbor's neighborhood to see you treat people well. And so maybe they will going to be compelled to act well. Uh, you want to live in a good community where people treat each other well. So it's like someone's got to start this this chain reaction. So I'm going to treat people well in my neighborhood because I'm hoping that everybody will start treat, treating each other better. And eventually, I hope it gets back to me. All right. And then finally, a productive exchange. Um, it, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a direct exchange, right, where I give you one thing, you give me something else. But it's an exchange where both people incur the same cost and the same benefit. So you think about something like a sports team, it's like, we all work hard. So we're all given the same cost, we all practice really hard, but we all get to reap the same benefit of winning the game. So when you and your teammates are at a practice, it's not a direct exchange because it's not like I'm, you know, I'm trying to beat you, right, with regard to why we're practicing it. I want all of us to incur the same cost of working really hard uh, so that we all get the same benefit of 
uh, of winning the championship. All right. So at social exchange theory down below, click that link, watch Dr. Walter Williams uh, discuss some economics for five minutes, and then I will see you next class period.